Thank you very much uh, for selecting our abstract for this meeting and this session. I have a pleasure to present the result of phase 1b portion of CARTITUDE 1 CAR T um, therapy targeting BCMA in relapse refractory myeloma, which I'm presenting on behalf of authors listed here. Let me start with uh, construct use for CAR T therapy. JNJ uh, 452A is CAR T construct containing 41BB, costing lateral domain, and two BCMA targeting single domain antibodies, which are shown here on the right, designed to confer avidity. This construct is identical to one used in Chinese Legend 2 study, uh, which um, uh, has been presented uh, before and uh, for many of you um, uh, familiar with high, deep, and durable uh, overall responses and manageable text, the safety profile. Uh, here is a study design for both portions of the study. Um, on the left, the uh, primary objectives for 1B was to characterize safety and confirm phase two dose as informed by legend two study. Uh, in phase two, um, we are evaluating efficacy of JNJ4528. Key eligibility criteria shown below include progressive disease, uh, adequate performance status, measurable disease, and at least three prior lines of therapy or double refractory disease, provided that prior treatment included PI, IMIT, and CD38 therapy. On the right, you see study treatment design, which is similar to many CAR T therapies, which include uh, in a phase of apheresis after screening, um, lymphodepletion with cyclophosphamide and fludarabine with those doses, and then infusion of CAR T cells. Uh, because we were informed by a previous study, uh, we targeted 0.75 million viable CAR T cells as a dose to be infused in, in this study with this range per study design. And at the end of it, after enrollment of 29 patients for CAR T treatment, the median administered dose was 0.73 million viable CAR T cells per kilo. The results which I will show in the next few slides are after six months follow up, uh, median follow up uh, at cutoff date uh, November 6, 2019. Here are basic uh, demographics shown on the left. Uh, of all enrolled and treated patients, 29, uh, which um, uh, to highlight few uh, um, indicate that median age was 60, uh, median um, uh, years from diagnosis was six years with this range, and 25% uh, um, uh, with um, high risk cytogenetics. Uh, the patient uh, received median five lines of therapy with this range, and 83% of patients um, received um, uh, bridging therapy. On the right, you have baseline um, disease characteristics and pre treatment history. As per eligibility criteria, all patients 100% have been triple exposed. 86% of patients uh, enrolled uh, were uh, triple refractory, 72% penta are exposed, and 31% penta refractory. Here is a slide with safety on the left, on the top left. Uh, hematologic toxicities, as expected, were fairly common in majority of patients and mostly grade three, as you can see. Uh, Non-hematologic toxicities were less frequent uh, and mostly mild, as you can see, uh, in a third of the patients increased AST, ALT, diarrhea, and upper respiratory infection mostly grade one and two, and only in a handful of patients, uh, grade three or higher. CRS is shown on the right, graded by Lee criteria, and here shown by uh, grade level. Grade one was observed in 48% of patients, grade two in 38% of patients, and single uh, patients had grade three and grade five. Uh, grade five patients develop um, uh, uh, S uh, HLH um, uh, and uh, has um, uh, um, died in stringent CR. Here is a um, detailed uh, uh, description of uh, CRS and neurotoxicity um, uh, to point uh, a very predictable time to onset of CRS. Uh, it, it, it happened around day seven with this range, but around seven for most patients and with duration of CRS predictably around four days. 
For superlative measures, we used uh, TOSTI uh, in 76% of patients, uh, anakinra in 21, and corticosteroid in 21 patients. Uh, percent. Vasopressor was used in two patients, and one patient was um, uh, put on a ventilator. Um, CAR T associated ICANs were observed less frequently in 10% of patients, mostly mild, and one patient was grade three, which concurred with uh, grade three CRS and resolved. Here's um, a first look at um, efficacy looking at um, a forest plot, plot of tumor burden reduction. As you can see, uh, all patients uh, received, uh, achieved uh, at least 50% reduction of the disease. Um, five patients uh, had less than 100% uh, reduction, but all remaining had 100% or close to 100% disease reduction showed here in this forest plot. To look uh, in more detail by NWG criteria, you can see that uh, overall response uh, was 100% again, um, and we see 69% uh, CR or better, 66% stringent CR and 86% VGPRs or better. And this is on intent to treat. Um, by correlating with VCMA pretreatment, there was no uh, difference uh, based on VCMA in terms of depth of response and uh, level of response. Median, to time, um, uh, median time to first response was um, one month, so fairly rapid, as well as median to achievement of a CR or better, also one month with those ranges shown on the right. Here's um, a look at uh, manual residual disease, which we assessed using ClonoSeq by next gene sequencing with adaptive um, uh, providing uh, that service. On the left, you have patient by patient color coded level of MRD. Brown color is MRD 10 to minus 6, and this orange color 10 to minus 5 to 10 to minus 6. Uh, 23 patients had baseline and at least one post baseline bone marrow sample available for MRD assessment. Uh, of these patients, five had no identifiable clones. From, so from 17 patients available for MRD, all achieved at least 10 to minus 4 um, MRD negativity. And of all of these patients, 82% uh, um, achieved at least IMW, uh, um, WG criterion of MRD negativity in 10 to minus 5 or better. Nine patients 10 to minus 6, 52%, and five patients 10 to minus 5. Here is a similar plot of uh, duration of response patient by patient. It is color coded, uh, and as you can see uh, by looking at uh, color green, PR, uh, um, purple, VGPR, and deep blue astringent CR. In many of these patients, we see depending of response over time, and by arrow uh, code, um, ongoing response at six months follow up. Um, all patients um, uh, shown here, um, 27. Uh, are uh, still progression-free at this cutoff time, um, uh, with two uh, who have progressed by orange color, one around uh, close to five months, and uh, one at uh, about eight months uh, from infusion of CAR T cells. As I mentioned earlier, one patient uh, died uh, with HLH-MAS. Here is patient-by-patient -patient profile of CAR T expansion and persistence. Very predictably, at um, uh, 13 uh, days uh, from infusion, uh, was a peak of this expansion. Um, and then very predictably, uh, but with different pharmacokinetics, decline of CAR-T levels. But at three months, 18 of 28 patients, so majority of patients had not detectable at this level of sensitivity of CAR-T. But interestingly, despite uh, that uh, fairly uh, quick disappearance of uh, detectable CAR T, we observe um, uh, continued um, deepening of response in uh, patients treated with this um, CAR T therapy. At peak expansion, preferential um, uh, cells were uh, central memory, CD8 positive cells. And we provided more details of um, profile of CAR T cells at um, infusion, um, expansion, and during treatment at our translational um, ASH uh, 2019 oral um, uh, abstract. 
To conclude, um, based on these results, um, we selected phase two dose of uh, this uh, construct at 0.75 uh, million per um, viable CAR T cell per kilo. Uh, and uh, that was um, used in our CAR T uh, portion um, uh, in phase two study. Um, that uh, data which we showed so far from 29 patients shows a very manageable safety profile. CRS was common in 93% of patients, but mostly grade one and two, only one patient grade three and one in grade five. Uh, in patients who had CRS, a median time to on onset was seven days, over 90% between days five and nine, which was very predictable. Neurotoxicity was infrequent uh, and uh, was generally uh, low grade one was grade three. In this uh, first look, uh, we see early at deep responses, 100% overall response, 69% CR better, 86% uh, VGPR better at six months follow-up. Uh, responses are fairly rapid um, with median time to first response one month and median time to uh, complete response also one month with those ranges. Of valuable patients all achieve MRD negativity at the 10, 10 to minus four level, with 82%, 10 to minus five or better. At uh, six months follow-up, 27 of 29 patients are progression-free. Safety and efficacy results of Cartitude 1 appear consistent with those which were reported by Legend 2. And based on that, phase two portion of the study have already completed enrollment, and there's a few phase two and three study already in progress. FDA um, uh, gave a breakthrough designation for JNJ4528 for relapse and refractory myeloma. I would like to thank all participating in study patients, uh, physicians and nurses and uh, team lead uh, and uh, members and everybody involved in development of this um, presentation. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Philippe Moreau, and uh, on behalf of my uh, colleagues, my co-authors, I would like to uh, present you today the results of the DREAM2 study, uh, testing uh, the impact of uh, the uh, antibody drug conjugate Belantamap mafodotin, Belamaf, in relapse and refractory multiple myeloma, uh, refractory to proteasome millimeters, refractory to emits, and refractory and or intolerant to uh, CD38 monoclonal antibodies. So here are the disclosures of uh, the uh, co-authors and my disclosures as well. And uh, as you know, um, patients with multiple myeloma that are becoming refractory to uh, emits refractory to proteasome inhibitors and refractory to CD38 uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, those patients have a very short overall survival, less than one year. And definitely uh, this setting represents the unmet medical need. Therefore, we need effective and novel uh, treatments uh, for uh, this group of patients. Uh, Belamaf is the first in class anti-BCMA, antibody drug conjugate. Uh, BCMA is an ideal target uh, since uh, its expression is uh, always uh, positive on the tumor cells uh, with very few or no expression on uh, other tissues. Uh, and Belamath uh, is able to uh, uh, induce apoptosis of the tumor cells through different mode of actions. Uh, Belamath can uh, deliver uh, the uh, toxin MMAF uh, to the tumor cells and then uh, induce uh, apoptosis, but also is able to induce an antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, uh, ADCP as well, and also uh, immune, uh, immunogenic uh, effect that will induce apoptosis. 
uh, the phase one, first in human dream one study, uh, was able to demonstrate that Belamaf uh, induce uh, responses in patients refractory to PIs, refractory to imids, and also a subgroup of patients were refractory to imids, PIs, and monoclonal antibodies. Therefore, uh, it was uh, logical to uh, expand the number of patients triple refractory uh, treated with two different doses of uh, Belamaf into the phase two DREAM2 study. And here I'm happy to present uh, you the results of this primary analysis of DREAM2. So patients at the time of enrollment had at least three prior lines of treatment. All of them were refractory to uh, imids. All of them were refractory to proteasome inhibitors and refractory or intolerant to CD38 antibody. They were randomized uh, to two different doses of Belamath, 3.4 milligram per kg IV provided every three weeks. Uh, and this dose was the recommended uh, dose evaluated in the DREAM1 study. But another dose was tested, 2.5 milligrams per kg IV on the same schedule, 30 minute infusion IV every three weeks. Uh, we uh, wanted to look at the uh, outcome of patients. We treated with a lower dose, 2.5, since at the dose of 3.4, uh, a subgroup of patients did uh, experience uh, some uh, toxicity requiring dose delay or dose reduction. The primary endpoint of the study was overall response rate uh, based on the uh, international myeloma working group criteria with a number of secondary endpoints such as duration of response, uh, progression for survival, overall survival, obviously uh, safety uh, as well. You can see here the number of patients that were enrolled in the two arms of the study, uh, 97 at the dose of 2.5 and 99 at the dose of 3.4. Uh, the number of prior lines of treatment uh, was high, as you can uh, uh, see, seven lines in median at the dose of 2.5 and six uh, prior line of treatment in median at the dose of 3.4. Uh, roughly 40 to 50% uh, of the patients had high risk cytogenetics and a significant number of patients, 20% of the patients had extramedullary disease at the time of study entry. And of note, uh, all patients as mentioned previously, were refractory to imids and to proteasome inhibitors, but also refractory to CD38 uh, antibodies. Both those groups received a median of three treatment cycles, and the median dose intensity was uh, 2.4 for the 2.5 milligram per kg group, and due to a higher incidence of dose modification, the dose intensity was lower uh, for the group of patients tested at the dose of 3.4, and the median uh, dose intensity uh, level was 2.9. You can see here the uh, overall response rates um, at the two different dose level. Uh, at the dose of 2.5, overall, we have a response rate that is 31% and 34% at the dose of 3.4 milligram per kg, assessed by an independent review committee. If you are adding uh, minimal responses, so uh, um, a decrease of the M component from 25 to 50%, what we are calling clinical benefit rate, 34% at the dose of 2.5, and 39% uh, of the patients experience a clinical benefit at the dose of uh, 3.4. Uh, this is important since almost all patients had the progressive disease at the time of study entry. So the study met its end point. The goal of the study was to demonstrate that with the two doses of Belamath, 
uh, the response rate would be at least 30%. Some of the patients are still receiving the drug and are still uh, in, uh, uh, not uh, progressing uh, during uh, this study, uh, during the follow-up. The median duration of response was not reached in either those uh, group, and the estimated probability of having a duration of response of more than four months was 78% at the dose of 2.5 and uh, 87% at the dose of 3.4. The median progression for survival was roughly three months at the dose of 2.5 and was higher, uh, almost five months, 4.9, at the dose of 3.4 milligram per kg IV every few weeks. In patients with a minimal response, uh, the median PFS was not reached in either dose group. And at the time of the study report, and the paper is now published by Dr. Lonial, uh, the uh, uh, median follow-up was uh, 6.5 months. Obviously, uh, due to the short follow-up, we can not uh, discuss overall survival data uh, since uh, this analysis is not mature for either those group. So what about uh, toxicity? As you can see here, the uh, most uh, common uh, grade three and four adverse event were kerat keratopathy uh, observed in 27% uh, of the patients at the dose of 2.5 and roughly 30% at the dose of 3.4. Also, grade three and four thrombocytopenia was 20% at the dose of 2.5, and anemia was also uh, the most common uh, grade three and four adverse event reported, roughly 20, 25% of the patients. Uh, those adverse events were managed with those delays and those reductions. And you can see that uh, the uh, most important cause of those reduction and those delay was keratopathy. Uh, the, uh, those reduction uh, were observed in 23% uh, of the patients at the dose of 2.5 milligrams per kg and 27%. Uh, of the patients at the dose of 3.4, respectively. And uh, delays uh, were also frequently reported in roughly half of the patients in the two uh, groups. But very few patients had to permanently discontinue uh, the treatment uh, due to uh, kerat keratopathy. So this toxicity, the ocular toxicity, is uh, very well known, in fact, uh, with the uh, MMAF, uh, this uh, monomethyl uh, oristatin F, the, and the uh, uh, exact mechanism of uh, this toxicity is unknown. A subgroup of patients uh, did receive uh, uh, some uh, corticosteroids eye drop in order to try to reduce uh, this uh, uh, toxicity but this uh, prophylaxis was ineffective, and it is not recommended to systematically propose uh, corticosteroids eye drops to the patients. So you can see here uh, the number of patients with the uh, event uh, in the two uh, cohort groups. Uh, it is important to note that among patients with keratopathy worse than baseline at the end of treatment, uh, the median time to resolution was roughly uh, two months at the dose of 2.5 and three months at the dose of 3.4. A very small group of patients, some patients had a transient worsening of the vision, but they did improve subsequently and were able to receive uh, the treatment. But we do observe as well some definite worsening of the vision uh, at the end of treatment. And among the 22 patients uh, at the dose of 3.4, 45% uh, uh, recovered, and the median time uh, uh, to resolution was two months. At the lower dose, 
among the 22 patients with a definite worsening of the vision at the end of treatment, the vast majority, more than two thirds of the patients did recover and the median time to resolution was 21 days. Uh, importantly, permanent loss of vision was not reported in either a dose group. So to conclude, I would say that single agent Belamaf with these two doses that were tested, uh, 2.5 and 3.4 milligram per kg every three weeks, IV showed a significant uh, response in very heavily pretreated patients uh, in this unmet medical needs setting uh, with more than 30% of response in both groups and with a clinical uh, benefit uh, of roughly uh, 40%. Importantly, we do not need to uh, uh, use any pre-medication uh, with uh, Belamap. Belamap appears to have a manageable safety profile uh, with no new safety concerns identified uh, after uh, the enrollment of patients into the BRIM1 and the BRIM2 study. Uh, obviously, the ocular toxicity that is quite common uh, has to be carefully uh, assessed but we know that uh, it can resolve in the majority of the cases and we can dose reduce the patients if we want a, a, a specific patient is responding uh, to uh, Belamaf. So Belamaf is easy to administer uh, via a short off-the-shelf infusion uh, with no mandatory uh, premedication as I mentioned previously. Therefore, Belamaf uh, is showing a significant activity uh, in very advanced patients, particularly those uh, refractory to PIs, refractory to imids, and refractory or intolerant to CD38 antibodies. And Belamaf is now uh, tested into a different phase three trials, both in the relapse, but also in the frontline setting. And I would like to thank all the patients and all my co-authors uh, and uh, uh, Glaxo uh, for uh, proposing uh, this uh, very uh, interesting study. And uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention today. Dream 5, a platform trial evaluating Belentamab Macedotin, an anti-BCMA-directed immunoconjugate in combination with novel agents in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. This presentation is given by Ira Gupta on behalf of the co-authors. A key unmet medical need is for effective treatments for patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received multiple lines of therapy. Belentamab mafodotin, which I will call Belamap during this presentation, is a first-in-class anti-drug conjugate targeting the BCMA receptor. The figure on the right side illustrates the multimodal mechanism of action of Belamap through which it binds to BCMA and eliminates myeloma cells. The GREEN2 study, which is the subject of another presentation at this Congress, evaluated single-agent Belamap in patients with heavily pretreated relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. Belamac was found to have a manageable safety profile and demonstrated clinically meaningful, deep, and durable clinical responses. Although DREAM2 assessed Belamac as monotherapy, combining it with other agents with other mechanisms of action has the potential to achieve additive or synergistic effects. Today, I will be describing the ongoing DREAM5 study, which will evaluate a number of Belamap containing combinations. This slide illustrates the study design of DREAM5, which incorporates multiple sub-studies into one master protocol. Each study evaluates a different Belamap containing combination versus a shared Belamap monotherapy arm. Phase one of each study will be a dose exploration phase shown on the left side of the slide, which will enroll up to 10 patients per dose level. 
In this phase, each sub-study will consist of multiple dosing cohorts and may involve dose escalation or de-escalation. Further details on the first three sub-studies will be described later in this presentation and there is a potential to add further sub-studies within the master protocol. Following those exploration, an interim analysis will confirm whether to proceed to the cohort expansion phase and will identify the recommended phase two dose. For the cohort expansion phase, shown on the right, patients will be randomized first to a sub-study and then randomized within a sub-study to either the investigational combination treatment or a Bellamass monotherapy control arm that is shared across all sub-studies. The primary analysis for each sub-study will be six months after the last patient has been dosed. For the dose escalation phase, the primary objective is to assess the safety and tolerability of Bellamass in combination with other anti-cancer treatments, and as mentioned on the previous slide, to establish the recommended phase two dose. Secondary objectives are clinical efficacy through overall response rate to describe the safety and tolerability, including assessment of ocular findings. For the escalation phase, the primary objective is to assess the safety and tolerability of Bellamass in combination with other anti-cancer treatments, and as mentioned in the previous slide, to establish the recommended phase two dose. Secondary objectives are clinical efficacy through overall response rate, to describe the safety and tolerability, including assessment of ocular findings. The primary objective of the cohort expansion phase is to assess the clinical activity of Bellamass at the recommended phase two dose in combination with other anti-cancer treatments versus Bellamass monotherapy. This will be evaluated via the overall response rate. Secondary endpoints are to further assess clinical activity and safety and to evaluate the plasma concentration of Bellamass and individual combination agents. Both phases of the sub-studies will include a number of exploratory objectives, including pharmacokinetics for each agent in the combination therapy and the bone marrow MRD or minimal residual disease assessment. Here we have a list of key eligibility criteria for DREAM-5. Of note, patients will require to have at least three prior lines of therapy consisting of an immunomodulatory agent, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. Patients with current corneal epithelial disease were excluded. As for patients who had previous treatment with Bellamass or prior allogenic transplant. Over the next three slides, I will be presenting more details on the rationale for the combination treatment being assessed in the first three sub-studies. This slide shows sub-study one, which will evaluate Bellamass plus GSK317-4998, which for the purpose of this presentation, I will call GSK998 versus Bellamass therapy. GSK998 is an anti ox agonistic monoclonal antibody that binds to a co-stimulatory ox receptor, which is expressed primarily on activated CD4 positive and CD8 positive E cells. As illustrated by the figure on this side, ox signaling promotes effector T cell proliferation and survival while blocking the suppressive function of regulatory T cells. This induces a T cell mediated immune response against the tumor cells. As an ox agonist, GSK998 has the potential to enhance immune mediated anti tumor activity and overcome immune resistance. This may be enhanced when combined with an agent causing immunogenic cell death such as Bellamass, data from the preclinical study by Montez D. Oka et al. are supportive of this hypothesis. Substudies 2 
will assess Bellamass in combination with GSK 335-9609 or GSK 609, which is an anti-ICOS monoclonal antibody with agonistic activity in ICOS expressing CD4 positive and CD8 positive effector T cells. ICOS has an important role in the proliferation, differentiation, survival, and function of T cells. GSK609 was developed to enhance T cell function and enable anti tumor responses without depleting ICOS expressing cells, as shown in the figure. The third ongoing substudy will assess the combination of Bellamax and NiroGCSTAT, a gamma secretase inhibitor that has been shown to prevent the cleavage of transmembrane proteins, including notch, amyloid precursor protein, and BCMA. The figure on this slide illustrates the activity of gamma secretase, which cleaves membrane brown BCMA and releases it into the extracellular domain. This reduction of membrane-bound BCMA may impact the efficacy of BCMA-directed agents such as Bellamap. Preclinical activity has shown combining Bellamap and niro -C stat to have a synergistic effect, providing the rationale to support the clinical evaluation of this combination in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. Dream 5 study is currently ongoing and the sub-studies are open to accrual. I would like to thank all my co-authors to their contribution and your attention to this presentation. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas Martin from the University of California, San Francisco, and I'd like to thank the organizers for selecting our abstract for presentation. I'm going to present data from a phase 1B study of Isituximab plus carfilzomib, a doublet as treatment for relapse and refractory multiple myeloma. This study was done in collaboration with the Multiple Myeloma Research Consortium, the MMRC, and investigators from Hackensack University in Mount Sinai in New York. Here are my disclosures. Um, I think we've all seen a background slide of CD38 and understand the majority of its mechanisms of action. What we focused on in this study was that isituximab can, do, can induce apoptosis without cross-linking and that perhaps this would be uh, at least additive effects when combined with a proteasome inhibitor, carfilzomib. We know carfilzomib can induce ER stress and also downstream uh, effects of uh, inactivation of uh, NF-kappa B that causes apoptosis. So we're hoping that those, again, would be either additive or potentially synergistic. We looked at this as a, a xenograph model. And here you can see, this is data from Blake Abtap, as well as Byron Hahn at UCSF. This is uh, unpublished data, looking at a, uh, an H929 murine cell model, cell line model. And those mice treated with the combination of isituximab uh, plus carfilzomib in the black line showed a significant reduction in tumor burden and at least an additive effect uh, compared to carfilzomib alone in brown or isituximab alone in pink. Now, I will say that uh, isituximab is now currently approved for use in relapse refractory myeloma. It was approved based on the Icaria study showing a benefit of ISA together with an IMID pomalidomide and dexamethasone versus dexamethasone, showing an improved progression-free survival. Um, and consequently, we embarked on this study. This is a standard single arm phase 1B open-labeled multi-center trial. It was a three plus three design. The primary objective was to determine the MTD of uh, isituximab with standard dosing of carfilzomib at 27 milligrams per meter squared. There were some secondary uh, objectives, including to assess um, PT, PK, and activity, and to confirm safety with the two drugs together. There are two phases, a dose escalation phase, where we tested three dose levels, and an expansion phase, in which we added an additional 18 patients 
to, um, again, assess activity and confirm safety. Our goal was to have um, at least um, more carfilzomib sensitive patients than carfilzomib refractory patients um, in this study to get a true assessment of how carfilzomib, how isotuximab and carfilzomib would do together um, in an er early line of, uh, of therapy. Here's the study schema. Patients received induction cycles of therapy from cycle one to eight. It was a 28 day cycle. Carfilzomib was given standard dosing two days a week, three out of four weeks. Again, 20 milligrams for day one and two, and then 27 milligrams thereafter. Isatuximab was given in three dosing uh, levels, 10 milligrams per kilogram every other week, 10 milligrams per kilogram weekly for four weeks, and then every other week, or 20 milligrams per kilogram weekly for four weeks and then every other week. Standard pre-medications were given. They were mandatory in cycle one, but they were allowed, especially the dexamethasone, to be discontinued or to decrease after cycle one. After cycle eight, there was an option to go to maintenance carfilzomib dosing, where the carfilzomib days were day one, two, 15, and 16. And the isotuximab remained at day one and day 15. The key eligibility, these are relapse, relapse and refractory myeloma patients, two prior lines of therapy. Prior carfilzomib was okay, and they could even be refractory to carfilzomib. They had to have reasonable uh, kidney function, creatinine clearance greater than 30 mLs per minute, good counts, and good performance status. They could not have any recent cardiovascular uh, disease like recent MRI, uh, MI or any congestive heart failure. And they had to be more than 12 weeks from stem cell transplant. Um, 33 pa overall, 33 patients were enrolled, 15 in dose escalation and 18 expansion. Here's the demographics of the patients. Uh, key findings on this table are that about 30% of patients are greater than age 65. Um, three, three quarters of them were LEN refractory, 70% bortezomib refractory, and about a quarter of them carfilzomib refractory, and three quarters double refractory. 20% of the patients approximately had high risk cytogenetics. The most common cytogenetic abnormality was 1Q21 gain, which is present in 42% of the patients. In terms of patient disposition, all 33 patients are valuable for safety and response. 15 patients were enrolled in dose escalation. We did three each at dose level one, two, and three, and then did three additional patients at dose level two and three. Of note, um, there were similar safety and response signals from dose level two and three. And then PK studies, uh, PK data from this study and from other studies showed you know, favorable data for the 10 milligrams Q week versus Q2 week dosing. So that dose was selected for expansion. It was also easier to give with a decrease uh, infusion time. Now the median follow-up is 28 months. 29 patients have experienced disease uh, progression. 11 patients have died, they all died due to disease, and four patients remain on uh, study. The median number of cycles administered 10, and no patients uh, died due to the treatment um, or discontinued therapy due to toxicity from treatment. It was very well tolerated. And in terms of hematologic toxicity, here's the incidence grade one, two, and three of neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia, and leukopenia very little um, grade three toxicity, only 9% neutropenia and anemia, 6% leukopenia, and 3% grade three thrombocytopenia. And there was no cumulative toxicity over time. In terms of um, non-hematologic toxicity, the most common adverse event was infusion-associated reactions. It was seen in 18 out of the 33 or 55% of the patients, was almost all grade one and two. There was one grade three toxicity was from esetuximab and it was hypertension from esetuximab. Um, the majority of the reactions were ESA related, 51%. There was one that was carfilzomib alone related, one out of the 33 patients. In terms of other non-hemologic toxicities, this is a slide showing uh, toxicity occurring greater than 20% of patients. You can see there's no grade four toxicity. There's very little grade th three toxicity shown um, in green, the most common grade three toxicity was hypertension. Now, infections were common um, and seen in about 90% of the patients, 
but the majority of the patients, they were deemed to be not study treatment related. There was mostly upper respiratory infections, viral infections. There were two patients, 6% had, who had pneumonia, and that was the most common uh, treatment related um, infection. If we go to the efficacy, these are the overall response rates. Uh, in the red bar, shows overall response rate of 70%, with 33% of the patients achieving a PR, 24% a VGPR, and 12% a stringent CR or a CR. Now, if we look at key subgroups in the LEN refractory, the overall response rate was still good, 68%. Carfilzomib refractory, 60%. Dual refractory, 68%. And those who had high-risk genetics actually had a really nice response of 83%. Median time to response was four weeks, and responses deepened over time. Here's a progression-free survival. It's 10.1 months with a 95% confidence interval shown. Here's the overall survival curve. The median overall survival has not been reached, and the probability of overall survival at 30 months is 63.3%, and you see the 95% confidence interval. So in conclusion, the combination of esituximab and carfilzomib at 27 milligrams per meter squared in doublet uh, demonstrated impressive overall response rate, 70% in a progression-free survival of 10.1 months. And this really, pre, uh, really heavily pretreated patient population. Um, all subgroups appeared to benefit from the comp combination, including those that were imid refractory, PI refractory, carfilzomib refractory, or dual refractory, as well as patients with high-risk cytogenetics or fish abnormalities. The combination was extremely well tolerated, and the safety data is really consistent with the known safety profiles of each agent. There was no significant cardiovascular toxicity seen. The results of this study uh, led to the development of a randomized phase three study, the IKEMA study, that is currently ongoing in comparing esituximab, 10 milligrams per kilogram, Q week, four doses, then Q2 weeks, together with carfilzomib, 56 milligrams per meter squared, with 40 milligrams weekly of weekly dexamethasone um, versus carfilzomib, 56 versus dexamethasone, 40 milligrams weekly in patients with relapse refractory myeloma, having received one to three prior lines of therapy. Um, we hope to see data in that soon, but in, in essence, um, this was a more heavily pretreated population and had a very nice response rate. Thank you very much for your attention. We are grateful to the patients and their families for participation in the study. We also thank all the investigators and members of the study teams. Thanks again. Good, uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to um, give this overall presentation. Uh, and by the way, I would like on behalf of all the co-authors um, and, and, and members of the Insight Registry Group and Steering Committee, uh, thank the organizers of the committee meeting for uh, selecting our abstract as an oral presentation. The title of the abstract is Outcomes in Relapse Refractory Myeloma Treated with IRD, Ixazomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone in routine clinical practice uh, uh, compared to the uh, data reported in the phase three study for registration, the Tumalin MM1 study. Uh, so uh, my disclosures are listed here. Uh, I give you uh, 20 seconds to look at them. Uh, so, as a background, I'd like to remind everyone that Ixazomib, nin Laro is uh, currently approved in the European Union in combination with lenalidomide, ravlimid, and dexamethasone for the treatment of multiple myeloma patients uh, starting from the first relapse, the so second line. Uh, the approval was based on uh, the phase three uh, international multicenter tumalin MM1 study, randomizing lenalidomide dexamethasone patients to ixazomib lenalidomide dexamethasone. That study demonstrated a superior PFS uh, with a median 20.6 months versus 14.7 months and hazard ratio of 0 0.74 uh, compared to the control arm with an improved response rate. Uh, particularly an improved, uh, a greater 
equal VGP of rate, which is the, the deepest response, the best response uh, among the best response we could reach and we could have for these patients uh, for exosomy breath dex versus the control arm, which I remind was Revlimid dexamethasone, but specifically with placebo, uh, which is one of the unique studies that has been looking at the comparator arm, including a placebo. Uh, the outcomes and tolerability in routine critical practice often differ from the uh, real life uh, practice. And it is very important to uh, demonstrate uh, and duplicate the data in the real life compared to clinical practice as a clinician, particularly thinking about the cost of the drugs uh, and to verify that the, the data from clinical trials that uh, that are used by the governments in Europe and by EMA uh, to get an approval and a reimbursement based on the scientific scoring system. Uh, these data from clinical trials could be replicable in real life. There are growing evidence uh, to suggest that regarding exazomy based regimen, that is the case. What we found in clinical trials is often uh, replicated in, in real life. Uh, and, and so the objective of that study was to once more demonstrate this on the basis of to a very specific sort of registry, the Insight Myeloma Study, which is an um, international effort, uh, which I will detail in a minute, and the Czech Republic uh, a registry on uh, multiple myeloma. So the two, the two, uh, sorry, the two uh, registries we have used in more details, Insight, a global, it's prospective, it's observational, 4,311 myeloma patients were included from all over the globe. Uh, and the, the Czech uh, Republic uh, uh, registry led by uh, led by uh, Dr. Roman Hayek, uh, which includes more than 6,000 patients with monoclonal gammapathies. Among them, uh, patients from uh, treated with Ixar Revlimid dexamethasone. In, in, in the INSIGHT registry, patients were recruited uh, having one to three prior lines of therapy being relapse refractory. And in the Czech Republic, uh, greater or equal one line, so again, relapse refractory. And, and what we are focusing here into is patients uh, that have received ixazomib, revlimid, and dexamethasone for the discussion. All characteristics of the patient will be uh, uh, depicted here now for you. So overall, 217 patients from 11 countries, 83 from the Insight uh, Global Registry, 134 from the Czech Republic Registry, with a median of approximately two prior lines. So not very advanced myeloma, but already advanced myeloma in the relapse setting. Uh, the range of the prior lines uh, uh, going from 1 to 12. The median age, as you can see here in this table, was 67 years. Um, and uh, in the two Malin MM1, it was 66 years for the XRF dex studied arm. So it's pretty superimposable. Um, you will see that the ISS staging score uh, uh, listed here for you is as expected overall and also uh, break down by the number of prior lines in second line, in third line, in fourth line, or beyond the fourth line. The, 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 most of the patients were treating in academic centers. However, uh, 10 to 20% of the patients overall have been treated in community-based hospital, giving an, an, a very nice approach and overview of uh, how is exazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone uh, given to the patients, how it benefits to patients across all type of uh, centers who can treat uh, myeloma patients. Um, the disease characteristic at starts of exazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone therapy are listed here for you. I won't spend too much time. I would just like to say that overall, the median time from diagnosis to start of exazomib, rev dex uh, for the two registry was 42.1 months. Uh, you can see here the ECO performance status, the M's protein isotype, and uh, extra MDRI disease presence. Of course, it increases the extraordinary disease presence uh, with the number of lines of therapy, which makes sense because you know that the more you 
uh, reach advanced myeloma, the more you have a risk to develop extraordinary disease. The M spike and the, 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 the isotype most represented is IgG, but that makes sense. It's universal in myeloma. And the ECOG performance status, uh, you can see that the very altered patients, ECOG3, is not uh, a lot represented. But again, uh, that uh, could be expected. Uh, and you can see that we, we have a series of numbers with an ECOG2, uh, which, which is consistent over the lines. And again, this is very important because these patients uh, uh, will ultimately very rapidly need a benefit from the treatment to improve. The reason uh, for initiation of ixazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone in real life are listed here for you. You can see that uh, there is overall two options. Either you, your patient is treated with uh, a treatment and you're not happy with that treatment, not necessarily because the patient had progressed on that treatment, but because the patient has, has not responded nicely, and therefore you change the type of treatment you give to the patients. That that could be one option for the decision to start exazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, IRD. The other and most frequent option I have to acknowledge is the fact that the patient has relapsed or progressed from the prior line, and therefore you decide to give a new line of therapy and you pick exazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone because you believe this will very much benefit to the patient. You can see that most of, in most of the cases here uh, uh, and for all type of lines of therapy when ixazomib lenalidomide was dexamethasone was started it was most of the time started in relation to the fact that the patient progressed to the prior line to the previous lines and therefore the physician thought it was very convenient to start ixazomib lenalidomide and dexamethasone but in certain cases approximately 10 20% of the cases according to uh, the lines we have seen that patient the physician sorry had decided to simply switch from one treatment to the other because the first treatment was not uh, providing sufficient depth of response now, if patient progressed as expected, most of them uh, would have progressed with bone lesions. Again, in the relapse refractory uh, myeloma setting, this is absolutely expected. A series of the patients, approximately 10, 20 percent, uh, will have had developed again anemia uh, in, a, in a lesser extent renal sufficiency and in a lesser extent a hypercalcemia. Again, nothing new here. When we retreat the patient, often it is because of the reoccurrence of bone lesions and anemia mostly and avoiding renal sufficiency and, and organ, uh, avoiding uh, and organ damage that could be detrimental to the patients. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a cartoon that has the objective to depict to you what type of treatment the patient have had before they start ixazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone, but on top, uh, so what type of treatment they got after they progressed on ixazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone. And so first of all, I'd like to remind to you that uh, 37 patients have had revlimid but were not refractory to revlimid before they start the line with ixar uh, and and uh, And uh, globally, you can see that uh, on the left part of the cartoon, you have the prior therapies. 90% had botezomib, which makes sense in Europe, uh, the first line of treatment. And if not in the first line, often in second line, we provide the patient transplant or non transplant eligible with botezomib based containing agent. And 60% and of them have had a transplanted. So these patients were not very elderly necessarily. Uh, of course, in Europe, often when we give a botezomib line of treatment upfront, we give VTD. Uh, uh, or VCD, uh, and in elderly patients, V-melphalan dex. Uh, and so you can, you can see why 90% of the patients had botosomine, 60% transplantation, and 47% thalidomide. A series of patients had thalidomide, carfilzomine, and daratumumab in a lesser extent. However, I'd like to remind to you that um, the majority of the patients with XRF dex got XRF dex in third line. The median prior line was two. Therefore, uh, you, you can appreciate that some of the patients have had uh, lenalidomide, carfilzomib, and daratumumab likely in second line, which is why it appears here. Then the patient got ixazomib, revlimid, dexamethasone, and we were interested, 
right part of the cartoon into appreciating uh, what type of treatment the patient were rescued with once they were uh, re relapsing on ixazomib, ravlimid, dexamethasone, and very likely refractory to ixazomib, ravlimid, and dexamethasone. And you can see that here uh, it is very nicely spread, spread uh, across uh, daratumumab and pomalidomide, which uh, by, at the time we were giving ixarefdex for Insight and the Chair Republic uh, registry um, were clearly approved in third line. That makes sense. Uh, carfilzomib is also approved in starting in second line, so it makes sense that we can see carfilzomib here. Uh, it's interesting to see that some patients could have been re-exposed to revlimid, maybe because they were not refractory from revlimid at the time. They they progressed from XRFDEX. It's surprising to see some thalidomide, but there might be some country with uh, with difficult access to some drugs. And so these these uh, these drugs to rescue XRFDEX patients exposed and refractory to it uh, makes sense overall in my in my view. So for the patient who got ixazomib, ravlimid, dexamethasone, what was the benefit of ixazomib, ravlimid, dexamethasone? And again, uh, the objective of the study was to try to demonstrate that with ixazomib use, even in a triplet-based regimen, we can duplicate, replicate uh, what we found from the clinical trials to Malin MM1 study, which is not always the case in, uh, for all drugs. And so you can see here that the combined overall response rate was 76% for Insight, 74% for the Chair Republic RMG uh, study, and therefore absolutely superimposable to the two Malin MM1. And so in terms of overall response rate, we really replicate what we found in clinical trials in the real life. You can see that the depth of response, approximately 30 to 40% of the patient have had better than VGPR, greater or equal VGPR, including, including complete response. And again, this is a, a very nice replicate to what we know with Tumulin. If we look at the PFS, the progression-free survival for the 80s, knowing that 86 patients, 40% had progressed at the data cutoff, the median PFS was globally 21.6 uh, and was obviously uh, always better if the patient received ixazomib revdex in second line versus subsequent line. You can see how in second line for the 94 patients who got ixazomib lenalidomide dexamethasone in the two registry in second line, we have a very nice, very interesting and appealing 30.2 month median PFS with a 95% confidential interval from 15.2 to not reach which let us think, let me think that if you can give ixazomib, ravlimid, dexamethasone in second line, you have a, a, a big number, a significant number of patients in your practice that will really benefit from the patients. And we see that in, in the real life. If we look at the duration of treatment, uh, again, you can see that overall it's 11.9 months, uh, but again, really uh, depends uh, in more details on uh, whether the patient had the ixazomib, ravlimid, dexamethasone in second line or in subsequent line. And you would not be surprised to know that the second and the third line, the patient really benefited to ixazomib, ravlimid, dexamethasone. Uh, but the more you wait to give the, this very effective triplet-based regimen, the more likely the benefit will go down. Now, a little bit of appreciation of how the triplet-based combination was considered manageable or not, whether there was a lot of side effects. So I'm very much in favor, before I give you the list, very boring table list of all the AEs. Uh, I appreciate very much that we start showing first how many patients had to dose reduce and how many patients had to dose discontinue. Because in the end, if the patient suffer from the treatment, there will be dose reduction and potentially dose discontinuation. So I think it's very important to start with this slide. Um, I'd like to say that overall, 16% of the patient decreased ixazomib dose, 36% revlimid, but only 10 and 21% respectively because of adverse events. So only 10% of the patients had to dose decrease ixazomib from four milligram, uh, three times a month a cycle, 28 days basis, compared to 21% for the ravlimid, four AEs. And I think this is a very low number 
uh, if we compare this to other drugs we give in the relapse refractory setting to myeloma patients. Now, if we look at discontinuation of fixazomib and lenalidomide, what, we, what I've talked a minute ago was reduction of dose. Now I'm talking about discontinuation. We are now 44% at 45% of the patient who had to stop ixazomib and lenalidomide. Now, if you look more in details uh, um, with more granularity, uh, 32% and 31% stop ixazomib and stop revlimid respectively because of adverse events. So, so one fourth, I would say, of the patients at some point uh, will stop the treatment uh, and uh, because of adverse event, and you have uh, this depicted for you here in cartoons. So as a conclusion to that uh, presentation, so I'd like to remind to you that we have here one of the first um, uh, international efforts of combining registries to, do, to try to replicate or to look into whether we can replicate in the real life what we have found in clinical trials. Uh, and this was uh, 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 thanks to the Insight Registry that was organized by the Takeda Company and thanks to the Czech Republic that uh, 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 allowed uh, us to mix and to match together the two registries inside and the Czech Republic. In that registry, we had all type of myeloma from the relapse refractory setting, and not, notably including elderly patients, advanced disease, comorbid patients. So really it's an all commerce registry. So it's a very nice picture of what the real life is about. We have demonstrated the effectiveness of XRFDEX in the real life, but on top of that, I believe we have so demonstrated that we perfectly uh, replicated what we have found in Tumalin MM1. Again, uh, overall response rate in the 74-80% ish and median PFS in the 2021 month ish with a specific focus on the patient in second line that truly benefited immensely uh, from the treatment. I'd like to remind to you a median PFS of 30 plus months. So we have here the demonstration that with the use of ixazomib in real life, we, we really replicate what we have found in the, in the clinical trials. And the, the, the scientific scoring system in the country is, is very much replicated. If we look at the safety profile, uh, dose reduction of ixazomib only in 10% of the patients, dose, continu dose discontinuation in approximately 32% of the patient because of adverse event, which I believe makes uh, Ixazomib, a very safe drug, very interesting drug uh, to uh, give to our patients with multiple myeloma in the relapse setting in the context of the approved regimen, Ixazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. With this, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of people to acknowledge. Uh, indeed, the people who helped us manage the inside registry, in, indeed, the Czech Republic. I uh, would like to thank the Millennium people, pharmaceutical company people who worked with us on trying to clean up all these databases and the people who organized the um, um, meeting uh, in the, uh, this coming meeting. Uh, thank you very much.